Chapter Two of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Two. Beware of her fair hair, for she excels all women in the magic of her locks. Shelley translated. It trailed suavely through my fingers, slipping across my palm like a belt of silk. It glided with the noiseless haste of a thing in flight. Quite naturally, even in the dazed moment of awakening, I closed my hand upon it. It was soft in my grasp, yet resilient, solid, yet supple. If I may speak irrationally, it felt as if it must be fragrant. It was a strange visitor to my experience, yet I recognized its identity unerringly as a blind man gaining sight might identify a flower or a bird. In brief, it was, it only could be, an opulent braid of hair. When I grasped it, it ceased to move. In the dense darkness of my bedroom, I lay still and considered. I was alone, or rather, should have been alone in the old house I had bought the day before. The agent assured me that it had been unoccupied for years. Who, then, was my guest? A passerby seeking refuge in a supposedly deserted house would hardly have moved about with such silent caution. A tramp of this genus would be a rarity indeed. I had nothing with me of value to attract a thief. The usual limited masculine jewelry, a watch, a pair of cufflinks, a modest pin, surely were not sufficiently tempting to snare so dainty a bird of prey as one wearing such plumage as I held. I have not a small fist, yet that braid was a generous handful. How did it come to trail across my bed in any case? And why was its owner locked in silence and immobility? Surely startled innocence would have cried out, questioned my grasp, or struggled against it. My captive did neither. I began to paint a picture against the darkness, the picture of a crouching woman, fear paralyzed, not daring to stir, to sob, or pant or shiver lest she betray herself, or, perhaps, a woman who is not hushed by panic but by deliberation a woman who slowly leveled a weapon, assuring her aim in the blank darkness by such guides as my breathing and the taut direction of her imprisoned tresses. An ugly woman could not have hair such as this, or could she? I had a doubtful recollection of various long-haired demonstrators glimpsed in drug-shop windows who were not beautiful. Yes, but they would never have found themselves in such a situation as this one. Only resolve or recklessness could bring a woman to such a pass, and with spirit and this hair no woman could be ugly. How quiet she was! I suddenly reflected that she must be thinking the same thing of me, since neither of us had moved during a considerable space of time. Possibly she fancied me only half aroused, and hoped that I would relapse into sleep without realizing upon what my drowsy grasp had closed. No doubt it would have been the course of chivalry for me to pretend to do so, but it was not the course of curiosity. The deadlock could not last indefinitely. Apparently, though, it must be I who should break it. As quietly as possible, I brought my left hand forward to grope along that silken line which certainly must guide me to the intruder herself. My hand slipped along the smooth surface to the full reach of my arm, and encountered nothing. Check for the first attempt. The candle and matches I had bought in the village were also beyond my reach unless I released my captive and rolled across the bed toward the little bookcase where I had placed them beside the flashlight. If I should speak, what would she do? And a new thought. Was she alone in the house? 
there came a gentle draw at the braid, instantly ceasing as I automatically tightened my hold. The pretense that I slept was ended. I spoke as soothingly and kindly as I could manage. If you will let me strike a light, we can explain to each other. Or, if you will agree not to escape, in spite of my efforts, my voice boomed startlingly through the dark, still room. No reply followed, but the braid quivered and suddenly relaxed from its tension. She must have come closer to me. Delighted by so much success attained and intrigued by the novelty of the adventure, I moved slightly, stretching my free arm in the direction of the flashlight. I am not a difficult person, I essayed encouragement, nor too dull, I hope, to understand a mistake or a necessity, nor am I affiliated with the police. Permit me, I halted abruptly. A cool edge of metal had been laid across the wrist of my groping hand. As the hand came to rest, palm uppermost, I could feel, or imagined I could feel, my pulse beating steadily against the menacing pressure of the blade. The warning was eloquent and sufficient. I moved no further toward my flashlight. Of course, if I had lifted my right hand from its guard of the braid, I could easily have pinioned the arm which poised the knife before I suffered much harm. But I might have lost my captive in the attempt, an event for which I was not ready, yet. Check, I admitted, although it is rather near a stalemate for us both, isn't it? The knife pressed closer, suggestively. No, I dissented with the mute argument. I think not. I do not believe you could do it, not in cold blood, anyway. You do not know, insisted the closer pressing blade, as if with a tongue. No, I do not know, I translated aloud, but I am confident enough to chance it. What reason have you for desperate action? I would not harm you. Have I not a right to curiosity? This is my house, you know, or perhaps you did not know that? A sigh stirred the silence, blending with the ceaseless whisper of the rain that had recommenced through the night. The braid did not move in my right hand, nor did the blade touching my left. Speak, I begged with an abrupt urgency that surprised myself. You are the invader. Why? What would you have for me? If I am to let you go, at least speak to me first. This is uncanny. There is magic in the third time of asking came a breathed, just audible whisper. Yet be warned. Call not to you that which you may neither hold nor forbid. But I do call, if that will make you speak to me, I returned, my pulses tingling triumph. Although, as to not holding you, you fancy you hold me? It is not you who are master of this moment but I who am its mistress. Her voice had gained in strength. A soft voice, yet not weak, used with a delicate deliberation that gave her speech the effect of being a caprice of her own rather than a result of my compulsion. Yet, I thought, she must be crouched or kneeling beside me on the floor, held like the lady of the beautiful tresses. Still, I doubt if you have the disposition to use your advantage, I began. You mean the cruelty, she corrected me. I am from New York, I smiled. Let me say, the nerve. If you pressed that knife, I might bleed to death, you know. Would you hear a story of a woman of my house and her anger before you doubt too far? Tell me, I consented, and smiled in the darkness at the transparent plan to distract my attention from that imprisoned braid. 
She was silent for so long that I fancied the plan abandoned, perhaps for lack of a tale to tell. Then her voice leaped suddenly out of the blackness that closed us in, speaking always in muted tones, but with a strange, impassioned urgency and force that startled like a cry. The words hurried upon one another like breaking surf. See? See? The fire leaps in the chimney. It breathes sparks like a dreadful beast. It is hungry. Its red tongues lick for that which they may not yet have. Already its breath is hot upon the wax image on the hearth. But the image is round of limb and sound. Yes, though it is but toy large, it is perfect and firm. See how it stands in the red shine? the image of a man, cunningly made to show his stalwartness and strength and bravery of velvet and lace. The image of a great man, surely, one high in place and power, one above fear and beyond the reach of hate. The woman sits in her low chair, behind the image. The fire shine is bright in her eyes and in her hair. On either side her hair flows down to the floor. Her eyes look on the image and are dreadfully glad. Ha! Was not beauty the lure, and shall it not be the vengeance? The nine lamps have been lighted. The feathers have been laid in a circle. The spell has been broken. The spell of High, son of Set, first man to slay man by the dark art. The man is at the door of the woman's house. Yes, he who came in pride to woo and proved traitor to the love won. He is at her door in weakness and pain. As the wax wastes, the man wastes. As the mannequin is gone, the man dies. On her doorstep he begs for life. He is coward and broken. He suffers and is consumed. He calls to her the love names they both know. And the woman laughs, and the door is barred. The door is barred. But what shall bar out the enemy who creeps to the nine lamps? See, the fire shines through the wax. The image is grown thin and wan. Three days, three nights, it has shrunk before the flames. Three days, three nights, the woman has watched. As the fire is not weary, she is not weary. As the fire is beautiful, she is beautiful. The man is born to her door again. He lifts up his hands and cries to her. But now he begs for death. Now he knows anguish stronger than fear. And the woman laughs, and the door is barred. The fire shines on a lump of wax. The man is dead. From her chair the woman has arisen and stands triumphant. But what crouches behind her, unseen? The lamps are cast down. The pentagram is crossed. The horror takes its own. The impassioned speech broke off with the effect of a snapped bar of thin metal. In the silence, the steady whisper of rain came to my ears again, continuing patiently. I became aware of a rich yet delicate fragrance in the air I breathed. It was not any perfume I could identify either as a composition or as a flower scent. If I may hope to be understood, it sparkled upon the senses. It produced a thirst for itself, so that the nostrils expanded for it with an eagerness for the new pleasure. I found myself breathing deeply, almost greedily, before answering my prisoner's story. "'Sister Helen,' I quoted as lightly as I could, and do you think Rossetti had no truth to base his poem upon? 
Her quiet voice flowed out of the darkness, seeming scarcely the same speech as the swift, irregular utterance of a moment before. Do you think that all the traditions and learning of the younger world meant nothing? Are you asking me to believe in witchcraft and sorcery? I ask nothing. Not even to believe that you will press the knife if I refuse to free you? Not even that, now. Compunction smote me. Her voice sounded more faint, as if from fatigue or discouragement. It seemed to me that the blade against my wrist had relaxed its menace of pressure and just rested in position. I seemed to read my lady's weariness in the slackened vigilance. Perhaps she was really frightened, now that her brave attempt to lull me into incaution had failed. Listen, please. I spoke earnestly. I am going to set you free. I apologize for keeping you captive so long. But you will admit the provocation to my curiosity? You will forgive me? A sigh drifted across the darkness. I ask no questions, I urged. But will you not trust me to make a light and give what help I can? You are welcome to use the house as you please. Or, if you are lost or storm-bound, my car is in the old barn, and I will drive you anywhere that you say. Let us not spoil our adventure by suspicion. In good faith, I opened my hand, releasing the lovely rope by which I had detained my prisoner. Then, with a quickening pulse, I waited. Would she stay? Would she spring up and escape? Would she thank me, or would she reply with some eccentricity unpredictable as her whim to tell me that tale? She did none of these things. The braid of hair, freed entirely, continued to lie supinely across my open palm. The coolness of the blade still lightly touched my wrist. She might be debating her course of action, I reflected. Well, I was in no haste to conclude the episode. When the silence had lasted many moments, however, I began to grow restive. Anxiety tinged my speculations. Suppose she had fainted? Or did she doubt my intentions, and was her quietness that of one on guard? I stirred tentatively. Two things happened simultaneously with my movement. The braid glided away from me, while the knife slipped from its position and tinkled upon the floor. I started up, perception of the truth seizing my slow wits, and reached for my flashlight. There was no one in the room except myself. Down my blanket was slipping a severed braid of hair perhaps a foot in length, jaggedly cut across at the end farthest from my hand. Leaning over, I saw on the floor beside the bed a paper knife of my own, a sharp, serviceable tool that formed part of my writing kit. Before going to bed, I had taken it from my suitcase to trim a candle wick and had left it upon the bookstand. Now I understood why her voice had sounded more distant than seemed reasonable while I held her beside me. No doubt she had hacked off the detaining braid almost as soon as I grasped it. The knife she had pressed against my wrist was to keep me where I lay while she made ready for flight, or amused herself with me. Flight? Say rather that she had leisurely withdrawn. Perhaps she had not even heard my magnanimous speech offering her the freedom that she already possessed. If she had stayed to hear me, probably she had laughed. Perhaps she was still in the house. I rose and lighted a candle under the impulsion of that idea, reserving my flashlight for the search. 
but there was no one in any of the dusty, sparsely furnished rooms and halls through which I hunted. The ancient locks on doors and windows were fastened as I had left them, although my lady certainly had entered and left at her pleasure. Puzzled and amused, I finally returned to my bedchamber. There was some difference in that room. I was conscious of the fact as soon as I entered and closed the door behind me. The candle still burned where I had left it, flickering slightly in some current of air. There was no change that the eye could find, no sound except the rain, yet I felt an extreme reluctance to go on even a step from where I stood. What I wanted to do was to tear open the door behind me, to rush out into the hall and slam the door shut between this room and myself. Why? I looked around me, sending the beam of the flashlight playing over the quiet place. Nothing, of course. I walked over to the bookcase, took up the braid I had left there, and sat down in an old armchair to study my trophy. On principle, and by habit, I had no intention of being mastered by nerves. It was humiliating to discover that I could be made nervous by the mere fact of being in an unoccupied farmhouse after midnight. The braid was magnificent. It was as broad as my palm, yet compressed so tightly that it was thick and solid to the touch. If released over someone's shoulders, it would have been a sumptuous cloak, indeed. In what madness of panic had the girl sacrificed this beauty? How she must hate me, now the panic was past. The color, too, was unique in my experience. A gold as vivid as auburn. Or was it tinged with auburn? As I leaned forward to catch the candlelight, a drift of that fragrance worn by my visitor floated from her braid. At once I knew what had changed in the room. The air that had been so pure when the house was opened now was heavy with an odor of damp and mold that had seeped into the atmosphere as moisture will seep through cellar walls. One would have said that the door of some hideous vault had been opened into my bedchamber. This stench struggled, as it were, with the volatile perfume that clung about the braid, so that my senses were thrust back and forth between disgust and delight in the strangest wavering of sensation. I made the strongest effort to put away the effect this wavering had upon me. I forced myself to sit still and think of normal things, of the men whom I was to see next morning, of the plans I meant to discuss with them. Useless. The stench was making me ill. A wave of giddiness swept over me and passed. My heart was beating slowly and heavily. Something in my head pulsed in unison. I felt a frightful depression that suddenly burst into an attack of fear, gripping me like hysteria. I wanted to shriek aloud like a woman, to cover my eyes and run blindly. But at the same time, my muscles failed me. Will and strength were arrested like frozen water. As I sat there, facing the door of the room, I became aware of something at the window behind my back, something that pressed against the open window and stared at me with a hideous covetousness beside which the greed of a beast for its prey is a natural, innocent appetite. I felt that thing's hungry malignance like a soft, dreadful mouth sucking toward me, yet held away from me by some force vaguely based on my own resistance. And I understood how a man may die of horror. Yet presently I turned around. Weak and sick, with dragging effort, I turned in my chair and faced the blank, uncurtained window where I felt it to be. 
Nothing was there, to sight or hearing. I sat still, and combated that which I knew was there. In the profound stillness, I heard the wind stir the naked branches of the trees, the flowing water through the fragments of the one-time dam, the sputtering of my candle, which needed trimming. Sweat ran down my face and body, drenching me with cold. It crouched against the empty window, staring at me. After a time, the presence seemed not so close. At last, I seemed to know it was gone. In the gush of that enormous relief, my remaining strength was swept away like a swimmer in a torrent, and I collapsed, half-fainting in my chair. When I was able, I rose and walked through the house again. Again, the rooms showed nothing to my flashlight except dull furniture, walls peeling here and there from long neglect, pictures of no merit and dreary subject. I had expected nothing, and I found nothing. It was on my way upstairs to my bedroom that a sentence from the invisible lady's story came back to my mind. What crouches behind her, unseen? The horror takes its own. The bedroom door opened quietly under my hand. The rain had ceased, and a freshening breeze came from the west, filling the room with sweet country air. The candle had burned down. While I stood there, the flame flickered out. After a brief indecision, I made my way to the bed, rolled myself in the blankets, and laid down between the four pineapple-topped posts. This time, I kept the flashlight in my hand. But almost at once I slept, and slept heavily far into a bright, windy March morning. End of chapter 2 Recording by Roger Moline